Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, today, session is uh, a novel service modeling framework for NFA networking. So it will be presented by three of us. And I'm Bing Hu from at and I'm Sukhdev Kapoor, distinguished engineer from Juniper uh, Networks. I work as a part of the Open Contrail uh, program. And my name is Georg Kunz. I'm with Ericsson, and I'm very active in uh, Gluon and in OPNFE. Thank you, uh, Sudev and Georg. So today, we will talk about the uh, service pref uh, uh, modeling framework. So we'll start with the, uh, the new paradigm shift in the NFA networking. What are the basic goals, and what is the Gluon? Basically, it's a very high-level architecture, and followed by the uh, current implementation and backend communication that's and will be introduced by uh, Georg, and how to create a new, new API. And uh, we will talk about the, also the Gluon roadmap and uh, integration plan with Neutron, and uh, we'll talk about the uh, Sudev. Um, so let's start with uh, paradigm shift. So in the uh, traditional data center networking, and all the traffic is usually not a bottleneck, and the traffic will be terminated at the application at SAS side. And so under these circumstances, um, the interoperability and the stability is always the key to the success of the uh, uh, SaaS applications in the traditional cloud. And so you want to achieve the uh, uh, portability of different VNFs and uh, um, SaaS applications to be running on different types of clouds. And uh, in the NFV networking, and things are a little bit different. And the traffic is usually high put, uh, throughput and usually and will be passed through instead of the termination at the SAS. For example, the virtual um, switches, virtual routers, the uh, virtual firewalls, and all the traffic are passed through those VNFs and uh, being switched or be routed to uh, different the, uh, destinations. And we need the high um, performance of the uh, traffic to be able to pass through those um, VNFs. And uh, so under these circumstances, and the so more important thing is the um, quick development and uh, um, accelerated deployment of new networking services and to achieve the time to market and uh, to uh, improve the business agility. So that's the uh, paradigm and the shift um, in the NFA networking um, uh, uh, demand. And also in the service from service provider perspective, right, and we are dealing with all of the different types of legacy networks. And uh, so let's, someone said that this, there, there are 99 protocols to deal with instead of the only TCP and HTTP to be dealt with in the uh, uh, data center networking. So which means that um, we need to have um, more structured the multiple testing controllers to be able to, um, able to manage the uh, different backends and different legacy demands. And so in this case, supporting the multiple testing controllers simultaneously on the backend is very important in terms of the uh, NFA networking perspective. And actually, it's more than the uh, NFA networking in, in this type of stage. For example, in the uh, ONS about a month ago, and uh, Google had a, a, a keynote speech, right? In Google's the data center networking, they even have the, uh, the hierarchical the SDN controller structure. They have a global SDN controller. They also have a local SDN controllers. And in Google's the Espresso um, uh, uh, global networks. So that's what's presented by Google's uh, keynote in the uh, uh, ONS. So all this means that the paradigm shifts and we need to have um, different the uh, requirement or the different the use case to be supported in the NFA networking. For example, we need to support the multiple um, networking backends simultaneously. We all need to also to support the quick development and accelerated deployment of new networking service APIs and uh, need to make these new APIs to be agnostic of those different backends. For example, backends could be an open daylight, could be owners, could be uh, control, could be any other uh, SDN controllers, local SDN controllers, and to control those different the, uh, 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 switches. And uh, so then, um, all in all, so we need the, uh, the networking service on demand, which basically means that and we need to um, support those unknown unknowns in the near future and for those new innovations that are happening and in the uh, 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 networking, MVP networking space. So the business goals um, here is, includes um, the working solutions that needs to be integrated with OpenStack, because OpenStack has a lot of different deployments and then commercial 
um, in the market. And we need to able to use both the new Chong and the new NFC networking service together so that they can, we can support both um, the happy use of new Chong in the traditional data center and also we need to serve our the, uh, uh, new users in the uh, new segment of new NFV networking. So the solution is called Gluon, and it's a, a model-driven extensible framework for NFA networking um, services. And uh, here is the very high overview of the Gluon, the architecture. And from the uh, Gluon architecture, and you can see um, there are basically two major components. So here we, 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 we saw two, uh, four components, but two major categories. One is Gluon, the uh, Gluon framework. So basically, it's a port arbiter that can maintain the list of the uh, mappings of um, ports and the different network backends, and also forwards the port-related uh, operations requests to the uh, correct uh, uh, backends as the network controllers. And the second types of the components we call the Proton, includes a uh, Proton server. It's basically Proton server is API server, and uh, hosts multiple uh, APIs simultaneously, which means that it can support multiple the NFV networking services. And uh, on top of the uh, Proton server, there are a set of Protons. <coughs> Each Proton is a set of APIs of a particular NFV networking services. Basically, it's a standard northbound interface. And for, for example, the uh, LC VPN, for the point-to-point uh, -point networks, for the service function chaining, or for any other type of the uh, uh, services that's been modeled and supported by those APIs. And uh, there is also a component in the southbound, it's called shim layer. So basically, shim layer is an adapter of the northbound interface of Proton and uh, with the um, actual the backends of those SDN controllers. For example, the shim layer for the open daylight, shim layer for um, the owner, shim layers for control, and for shim layer for any other SDN controllers as well. So that's the, um, the basic architecture about the how Gluon is designed. <clears throat> and uh, currently, the Gluon is implemented and, uh, uh, with Neutron. So in the, in, from the implementation perspective, and the Gluon, the framework, is implemented as the core plugin or extended core plugin of Neutron. So it basically extends or subclasses Neutron's core plugin and with the uh, logic or with the functions and to differentiate the port that's supported by traditional Neutron or the port supported by the protons. And based on the port from Proton, port from uh, Neutron, and uh, it routes um, the port request to either Proton server and to be handled by backend instant controllers, or it will just give to a uh, 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 MO2 agent, and uh, um, MO2 agent will work with that, the other uh, 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 Neutron backends. For example, in terms of control, it has the uh, uh, control mechanism driver and works with the uh, control instant controller under this uh, architecture. <coughs> and the more important part is we call it the YAML file. So YAML itself is basically it's a model of the network services. So for example, we may have the uh, YAML for the L3 VPN, we may have the YAML for the SFC, YAML for the point-to-point, -point, or YAML for any type of services. And uh, um, the Proton server will um, use a component called a particle generator. And the particle generator will read those YAML files and create the, um, uh, uh, um, that, that the API endpoints, the RESTful API endpoints up the root of the user URL and also the schema in the database. Yep, so, so that's basically what it says here. And so that's an example of the YAML file and uh, what's the philosophy. And uh, I mean, design time, you design the module of, the, uh, of those APIs in YAML and on the runtime, you particle generator to uh, generate the RESTful API endpoints, um, the database schemas and backend, the uh, uh, synchronization method, et cetera, et cetera, in order to make them to work together. So Georg will give the more uh, detailed introduction about the, uh, how the uh, uh, YAML look like and how to generate those APIs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so now you know basically why we want to have a model-driven approach in Gluon, right? Just to recap that, we want to have something that allows you to very quickly and, and kind of flexibly do design work um, and coming up with new networking APIs, right? So it's really about this design time thing. You need to just think about what kind of API you want to have. You write it down, and then you don't need to take care about the runtime aspects like creating the API, the, the REST API database schemas, and so on and so forth. So that's the overarching reason why we want to have a model-driven approach. But if you then look at the details, really, like you start asking, 
Okay, just defining a model probably doesn't cut it really. What are the properties of the modeling approach really? What, what should be the semantics of our modeling approach and what are the basic building blocks you can use to build new APIs? Um, so this is basically, we, we here I'd like to briefly cover two of the design goals that we have. Um, first one being, okay, we want to build um, a model-driven framework that provides the flexibility we need to cover, well, or to express whatever networking APIs might come up in the future. We don't know that yet, so it's really important that the model framework itself is flexible enough, and that means in turn that we need to really minimize the amount of implicit and explicit assumptions that exist and dependencies between API objects. So we need maximum flexibility here, basically. And then we need a couple of tools, um, like a set of basic data types, and we need to define the semantics, um, how to compose those um, objects, basically, to, in the end, eventually have an ideally hierarchical object model, that, which you can then use to, to create new APIs, uh, and, and leveraging, well, best practices of object-oriented design, of course. So that's, these are design goals covering the API modeling approach as such, but we also need to take care about, need to take care of how do we uh, make sure that multiple different APIs can coexist next to each other, and, well, at runtime in the same data center, in the same network, and even kind of bound to the same VM, for instance. So I'll talk about those on the next couple of slides. Um, specifically about the API object model. There are two different kinds of objects, base objects and API objects. Um, a base object is really just a, well, uh, a set of attributes uh, that, or that groups a set of attributes, so to say, um, and it is meant to be used um, in composing these and building more complex objects out of this. So um, our particle generator will not instantiate, so to say, a, a base object. It will not be something that you can modify later on in the API. It, in that sense, it's more really like an, something like an abstract class. It's something you built something else from. Um, on the other hand, the API objects are then the real objects, which the particle generator kind of creates. Um, we will have um, URL endpoints for each of those API objects. Each API object uh, is represented as a table in our database. So these are more the, the final, the concrete objects, basically. Um, in addition, we have an inheritance scheme. So one base object can extend another base object, and API objects can also extend base objects. So it's um, nothing entirely new, I guess, but that's, <coughs> these are the basic building blocks we want to have in order to come up with, our, with an API. And then, as I mentioned uh, before, for every API object, there will be, at runtime, concrete um, instantiations, or let's say we will create and expose the REST API for every um, API object, and that, will, that looks like this. Um, well, we have, when you look at the URL, we have a static part, which is just called Proton. Then the name of the API, or the model, in our case here, it's just example API, but it could be something like layer 3 VPN, fun service function chaining. And then you have the separate API objects. And the system automatically creates five common and very basic operations that you can immediately, right after bringing up the system, and well, after the system has read the model, can apply to these uh, API endpoints. Of course, it's, it's creation, modification. You can list all of them. You can list specific objects, and you can delete specific objects, all without needing, having to write a single line of code except for the model, of course. Um, of course, the, the, the body of the requests you send to these APIs is just JSON, um, nothing particularly here. Um, one thing to mention, I don't know if Bin mentioned that before, also part of the particle generator is an API client, so to say. So once you have an, a model, you can use an API client, a CLI client, <laughs> to immediately start um, sending requests towards this automatically created API. So this was just a basic overview about what the, the API building blocks look like, base objects and API objects. Uh, the next question is how can we make sure that given a certain 
yeah, API modeling framework or best practices that other users of this system come up with APIs that actually can coexist and, and how can we make sure that different networking services can be bound to the same VM, for instance. So in order to facilitate that and to give a guideline to uh, kind of uh, users who want to create new APIs, um, we have defined four base objects, um, a base port, which represents basically a VNIC of a VM. So it has properties such as uh, MAC address, MTU size, um, admin state, things like that. Um, we do have base interfaces, which kind of are linked to base ports. Those are layer two segmentation devices that allows you to segment basically traffic on, for instance, based on VLAN IDs or VXLAN VNIs. Then we do have, on the right-hand side, base service. That should be the basic um, entity that a, a creator of a new API should think about, OK, I want to create new services, right? And all the properties of a particular service should be somehow modeled as part of such a service object. And then that is kind of a fundamental thing here. We define a binding object, um, which is meant to bind a service to an interface. And this allows us at runtime, for instance, to, well, by creating or deleting this binding to, well, obviously bind a certain service, layer two, layer three, whatever, to a given interface on the other side. Um, yeah. So that, for instance, allows things like you keep the VM up and running, and you can, for instance, exchange just the kind of networking services which are bound to it by just kind of removing an existing service binding and creating a new one to, uh, towards another service. So this is the, the basic idea that you should, or that we want to give as a best practice. And talking about practice, uh, we do have um, a, an existing layer three VPN model right now that we can use to create and configure layer three VPNs. Um, and it kind of maps like this to the model, to the basic model that I just presented before. So um, we have a concrete port, which just extends the base port, and a concrete interface, which extends the base interface. Nothing fancy here, really. Um, but then you can see on the right-hand side, there's a VPN service, which matches or maps to a VPN instance, so to say. So the properties or attributes of this object are things like uh, IPv4 targets, IPv6 targets, route extinguishers, so very service or VPN-specific properties. And then in between, there is, again, this binding. And the binding attributes are things like the IP address, subnet, and gateway, because those are specific not to a service, really, but specific to the interface. When you bind a sp particular interface to one service, you need to have an IP, for instance, in that particular case. Yeah. So this should give a rough overview of how we kind of map our abstract model to a concrete model that we have um, running right now. At the same time, um, we are also working on further models, um, going into both extremes here <laughs> in terms of complexity. Um, we have a very simple point-to-point -point model, and the purpose of this one, it's, it's rather a toy model, but the purpose of this one is to show that um, our modeling API is capable of coming up with a kind of a new service that does not, and a new service API that does not exist, for instance, in, in Neutron right now. That's a little bit of a problem with the layer 3 VPN API because we, that exists in Neutron right now. Like this, uh, something like this that does not exist, um, it's really just a simple service that creates a pipe between two ports and whatever comes in on one side goes out, uh, comes out at the other side. So we again have port and interface, nothing special here. But then again, because it's just a pipe, we don't need any addressing or things like that. So the service basically just defines a protocol which can be something that describes the encoding of the data in this pipe. And then the point-to-point -point binding really just specifies, um, for instance, in this example, the bandwidth. So by using this very simple API, you can create pipes going from one VM to another with a specific uh, bandwidth, just to show what another potential API might look like. And then um, on the opposite direction, in terms of complexity, we are also looking into mapping an existing service function chaining model onto our Gluon modeling language. Um, and right now, this IETF service function chaining model is defined in Young. And um, we have created a very simplified 
gluon-based version of that. That's very important for us to validate that um, the modeling approach we have chosen and the language properties we have chosen is kind of complex, not complex, is rich enough to model um, or to cover real world complex models. Um, so the model right now is very simplified. We're still learning. We need to see how that evolves over time. Um, but, well, we're making progress on that front. That basically covers my part. And now Sukdev will talk about the future. Yes, so uh, whatever you heard, uh, what we want to do is we want to bring it as an integral part of Neutron. So we want to uh, take Gluon and make it as a, a part of Neutron as a, one of the stadium uh, projects, right? So therefore, one of the goals is to bring all these APIs which uh, George just mentioned as become an extension to, uh, to Neutron, right? In order to do that, uh, one of the thoughts which we have is uh, we're gonna uh, make a gluon as a, uh, as a new service plugin uh, within the Neutron community. So thereby, we can expose all these uh, APIs which we just uh, talked about uh, through the main Neutron API. So, so essentially it will look like Neutron gluon create an object or gluon, uh, Neutron gluon connect or bind uh, to endpoints and, and whatnot. So, so with that in mind, another thing which, uh, which Ben mentioned earlier, the idea is to have all the existing services which are available in Neutron uh, networking and be able to extend uh, the services on, on, on top of that, right? So for instance, uh, if, if, you're, if you have certain services deployed already, right, and now you want to bring in a new uh, NFV function through a YAML file. So what you will do is you will just create a YAML file and, and, and that, that gets fed into the, uh, the new Proton, which then gets exposed into uh, the API. And, and now you can start to use the new API through this extension. So that's, that's our ultimate goal. That's where we are heading, right? And by doing uh, the service plugin, uh, we can fully integrate it with the rest of the Neutron services, and we, we intend to leverage all of our existing networking projects which exist today, like networking ODL, you know, <coughs> the networking service function chain, you know, a VPN service, load balancer, whatnot. So this will essentially add on to that. And uh, one of the projects, I don't know whether uh, you guys heard it or not, but uh, I'm part of Open Contrail uh, uh, program. And we announced uh, uh, a networking Open Contrail yesterday. That's a new project which is being kicked off, whereby now independently Open Contrail uh, becomes a part of Neutron. So, Gluon is an excellent opportunity to leverage on that. So, so all of these seamlessly fit in together to bring in uh, one unified API and, and thereby, so uh, for instance, uh, when George was talking about the base object, right? So the, the Gluon will have base objects and, and the protons will come in and will add new attributes and all of a sudden we can create different models within the base object. So that, that's where we are going, and we are intending to utilize all of existing services and bring in add-ons. What does it do? It gives a huge win for the operators. You can, uh, you can bring in new NFV services in your existing deployments without requiring any forklifts. Right? And, uh, and you can run multiple SDN controls. Today, if, if for instance, Neutron, uh, or in OpenStack itself, you couldn't potentially run two monolithic plugins simultaneously, right? So this would allow that. So now we can bring all of them together, and, and the new architecture would look something like this. 
So you have a uh, neutron core plugin. So we're looking at it. <clears throat> Either we will use uh, the core plugin as is, or we will possibly uh, bring an extension to it and call it a gluon core plugin, right? And then you have uh, other all neutron extension APIs, which are uh, load balancers, uh, service function chaining, uh, routing, or whatever. All, all, all of those APIs exist. And on top of that, these new Gluon APIs get attached, right? And within uh, Gluon uh, service plugin sits in a Proton server. That's, that's exactly what Ben and George sort of talked about the details. Right? So they get packaged as a part of this, and the YAML files are the ones which get fed into the, the Proton server, and, and they become part of, uh, part of the APIs. Right? And, and then uh, on the back end, you have multiple SDN controllers. So now you can run uh, Open Contrail or ODL or ONUS, or whatever uh, you have. And uh, for instance, if you have a data center, <clears throat> or multiple data center for that matter, which are being managed by this OpenStack instance, uh, if they are managing different clusters, different parts of the data center, offering different services, uh, you can bring them together. For example, to give you an example, what I was able to do was by, by utilizing these principles. So I used two open contrail instances independently. They're both hosting services, and I was able to create a, a service chain across two controllers and, and be able to load balance. That something doesn't exist today. Or if you, if you need to accomplish that, you will have to do a lot of manual configuration. So you'll, you'll be pulling a lot of teeth to make that work. So the goal of this program is to make it completely seamless you know, through the one common extension to the Neutron API. So that's where we are heading uh, with this. <clears throat> so this is food for thought. This is, this is the way we are thinking about uh, because uh, some of the use cases sort of are known. We kind of know. Some of the use cases we don't know because the, the industry is evolving so fast and, and so many new use cases keep coming up. So we don't want to keep going and uh, keep creating new extensions, keep bringing up uh, more and more service plugins. So the, the, the intent here is what we will do is in, in addition to existing resources which Neutron has, which is the basic uh, resources such as ports, networks, and subnets, in addition, we will define two uh, Gluon resources, uh, Gluon endpoint and, and Gluon net function. So the endpoint is essentially a single point which you can associate any property with it. Uh, this, is, this is what uh, George was talking earlier. So you have a base object and then you can add additional attribute to it. So for instance, if you have an existing neutron network, which is running, and uh, you wanna add an additional property, be it a, a, a gateway service. So you can define a glue and endpoint to represent a, a gateway object, and, and you come in and, and you say, uh, glue and endpoint, connect with the neutron network, and that's it. So now what you're able to achieve is you have an existing network, all the ports which are uh, running on, on that network, now they can uh, bind to this external gateway. So that would be uh, one of the examples, right? And whereas uh, 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 net function is a, a little more uh, complex, uh, uh, surface endpoint, so where, which, where it actually defines the service. So you can take, uh, essentially you can connect a glue on endpoint to glue on endpoint to create a uh, point-to-point network. That's something which doesn't really exist today in, in Neutron. If you, wanted to, uh, if you wanted not to use Neutron network and create a port and create another port, 
and wanted to connect them. So with this, we can f sort of facilitate that, right? And, and similarly, with the, the, with the net function, uh, same thing. So you can uh, connect essentially gluon endpoint to endpoint. You can connect a gluon endpoint to uh, existing networks or subnets. So that way you're extending from one port, uh, from one endpoint to one port or multiple ports or to subnets or, or whatever you can. So you can seamlessly keep extending your services. That's the thought process we're going on. This is what we're chewing on, uh, and, and we, because uh, this is a, a community-based program, this is not like something locked in, we would like you to think of uh, use cases which you have, come in, participate, become a part of the team, become a core, contribute, and, 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 and sort of dictate the future of, of, of this program and help us uh, identify more use cases so that we can address them and, and bring them as additional protons and extend our thought process. Right? So that's, that's in uh, general uh, where we are taking this uh, forward. And uh, with this, I believe uh, I'm done with what I wanted to uh, communicate. So now we're going to open up uh, for questions. <laughs> So we have uh, roughly seven minutes to answer questions. Please use these uh, microphone mics. Good morning, gentlemen. Scott Fulton for the new stack and data center knowledge. Uh, one use case that came to mind as you were talking about gluing together uh, endpoints to endpoints to endpoints. It occurred to me that some of the uh, larger data center providers in this country, uh, organizations that, 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 that rent space effectively, Digital Realty, Equinix, they are in the business of, of providing connectivity as one of their key services. And recently they've been providing uh, uh, extended connectivity to public clouds. But could something like uh, what you're proposing with Gluon, uh, give them a new value add, which would enable an easier type of multiple connectivity, not just to individual public clouds like Amazon, but to to um, to other affiliate data centers. As I say, uh, regardless of what network architecture we're using, uh, I know I know Gluon may have been intended to be built on top of OpenStack, but it, but when you say that, that Gluon could connect endpoints to, uh, to other Gluon endpoints, that Neutron may not be involved here at all. Uh, perhaps as an opportunity for creating virtual links like, like Lincoln Logs and Tinker Toys that, that, uh, that could eventually connect anything to anything. Am I on the right track or something? Well, uh, one, one thing which, uh, when I was explaining, uh, I, I didn't mention. So these endpoints have properties where you can uh, you could call a local endpoint and a remote endpoint. You can specify that. And when you, uh, when you specify a remote endpoint, you will specify the properties as to how to reach that endpoint. So this is one of, one of the use case which I'm thinking is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, DCI, you know, interconnect. Between, between two, two data centers, uh, you could potentially uh, create a gluon endpoint which is uh, which is local which it, uh, which is connected to potentially uh, networks or a gateway which is uh, or a router or, or whatever object which is within the neutron and, and now you can define another object which represents which is not managed by local uh, OpenStack instance but is it lives somewhere outside, either by, with, in an, another data center which is managed by mm -hmm. another OpenStack instance or somebody else, as long as the properties by which that data, uh, the second data center can be reached, uh, you will define that as an endpoint, a remote endpoint. And, and next thing you will do is you will say bind mm -hmm. these two uh, endpoints, and, and that's how you can achieve that. So, and you can create multiple of these. Yeah. No. 
So I think I, I, I want to add one important point to this gentleman's question is that the gluon is designed as independent of any other the Vim. And the, so this gentleman's question was about the, uh, um, forget about the OpenStack, whether or not the gluon can support the uh, point to point, the uh, end points connections between different antenna centers regardless of the uh, underlying the network architecture. And uh, my answer is simply is yes. It's perfectly fit, no matter what the underlying the, uh, 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 the network controller it is, and but the design itself is independent. And here you can logically can see each of those SDN controller and points could be the controller of each data center, and that controller manages the internal data center networking within the data center, while it, um, data plan will connect all those data centers together with the blue ones, the uh, architecture. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very good question. Any other question? I guess we're done. Done. Okay. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank. Yeah. Thank you for your time. <laughs>